we need a screamo version of that. Move over, Sheena Shea. Screamo version by Dina Deadly of Raise Your Glass. Welcome, folks. It is so bad it's good with Ryan Bailey. This is your pal Ryan, and this is your Thursday episode. We're doing a Vanderpump Rules <laughs> Season 11 Episode 2 recap. And this this episode is entitled The Ultimate Betrayal. <laughs> the Ultimate. Can, can we give? <laughs> come on. Oh, my goodness. I can't even believe. I mean, I've been. What are we even doing with our lives? These are the best day of our lives. Are you kidding me? It feels like the worst. I feel like I'm in some kind of nightmare. It's like a Groundhog's Day again and again and again. We're going to be talking about this fucking stupid Sandoval for the rest of our days. And it's just going to keep on going because the guy keeps going on podcast after podcast and saying the most idiotic things. And folks, it's not even just the show anymore. It's the podcast. And then now you got the Vanderpump Rules after show, which you can find on Peacock. It's like a 22 minute episode that they've done the past. They did it last year too. I think maybe they do it on Beverly Hills, but it's 22 minutes where it just, if you thought the episode got you mad, watch that VPR after show. It's going to, it'll further enrage you. And I'm like, what are we doing this for? Is this for my blood pressure? What is going on? Oh, it fills in a lot of the blanks. How are you guys? Are you, are you good? What did you think of this episode? Let me just be honest. Like if, if, okay, I think this is one of the episodes that will, as, as time marches on, this episode will get better and better. And there are so many good scenes in this episode, so many funny little weird moments, which we'll talk about, but at the same time, I don't know, it, it, it left me feel at times I felt cold inside. It didn't feel like it, it. It had all of the pieces, but I think what it is, it's just that these people are truly, they truly dislike each other. They truly dislike each other. And it is one of those things that they are, of course, they're, they're friends. They've known each other for a long time, but they are at a spot where they truly dislike each other. And I think they all kind of know it. And even Schwartz will allude to it of like, I don't know, it's going to be kind of hard to get the group back together this time. Maybe the group shouldn't get back together. Like I've said this now the past couple of episodes or the, the, I mean, the past while is that this show, this show works as a show, right? It, it's worked as a show for so long and it's just been entertaining as a show and watching these people go through the ups and downs and downs and downs. But now it, uh, there's some kind of weird, sick enjoyment you get out of watching it, knowing that they truly can't stand each other, that they truly like they, they all say like, you know, do you, oh, I thought you were my friend, Tom Sandoval. You were like a brother to me. And you can see Tom Sandoval being like, what the fuck are you talking about, dude? You can tell how much Tom Sandoval does not like DJ James Kennedy. You can like the amount of and it, I feel like uh, it truly is bizarre world because at the end of this episode, you have Tom Sandoval literally calling DJ James. Oh, that's like your narcissistic behavior, dude. And I'm like, holy shit. Tom Sandoval has said the word narcissist and he's not even said it about himself. He said it about DJ James Kennedy. I mean, so you have this weird relationship. You have Lala and Ariana, whatever relationship that is. And we can keep talking like in podcasts and things like that, how everybody like, oh, that's my girl. No, that's not your girl. It does not feel like you don't say things like that about your girl. You don't. It, it doesn't seem like, you know, at the end of the day that Lala likes Ariana or likes how she acts in certain situations. And at this point, I don't know why Ariana would trust Lala past the fact that they're on a show together, a hit show together. And it's just, it, am I, am I, I know you're like, I was about to ask, am I going crazy? And you're like, yeah, it happened last year. But no, I feel like sometimes I just, that's what makes the show almost fascinating to watch now is because they are forced to do this show together. And in fact, the one relationship that the show is not able to force back into play is the Ariana and Tom relationship because Ariana does not want anything to do with Tom Sandoval. She doesn't want to move out of the house, but she also doesn't want anything to do with Tom Sandoval when it comes to the actual show. 
And I think that's interesting as well. I mean, you even have Sandoval in this episode going like, um, and dude, what's up? Uh, Ariana can come to my birthday if she wants. Like, we all know she doesn't want to. You know she doesn't want to. It's bizarre. Also, do you know how many birthdays I've had where I've just done nothing? <laughs> where I've just like didn't need to celebrate at all? Didn't feel like celebrating, didn't want to make my friends schlep over. You know, like, you know what I'm saying? Like the fact that Tom Sandoval still wanted to do a birthday party, it just kind of furthers that thing of there truly is yet no true self-reflection that Tom has truly done. Going to do a competition reality show is not reflection. I, I hate to burst anybody's bubble. It is not you know, penance by pain. It's collecting a paycheck because you probably do need the money, but say whatever you want to make yourself feel good. And if you get a little meaning out of it that way, go for it. But that's, come on, that's not reflection. That's not reflection. And once again, I, I, hate, I feel, how am I in, in the year of our Lord, 2024 defending Raquel? And can we just call her Raquel? I mean, I, Rachel, I appreciate, I'm going to call you Rachel, but I just would much for, for calling you Raquel. I just, I just would, it just, I like it better. I like it better, but I'll, I'll respect your wishes. But how is Rachel one of the only people that's actually done the work? How is that? How is she the one that actually did the work? I, I just, it's just watching a bunch of people. They're just all walls talking to each other. And the sound is just bouncing off and echoing and none of it's going into each other's ears. And then in this episode, we have the celebration or like the final party for the restaurant Pump. I mean, Pump has been there for 10 years. Nick and Lane. And guys, I just want to say I, I've had a lot of comments recently or new listeners of the show. Hi. Hello. How are you? Don't be scared. Um, they'll be like, um, what are you, what are you doing when you say Nick Elaine? Like they don't know I'm saying Nick Elaine, Nick Elaine is Lisa Vanderpump's main designer. He designed pump. He designed Tom, Tom. So all of that, like steampunk clocks and like ice dildo shaped things hanging from the ceiling. That's Nick Elaine and Nick Elaine and Lisa Vanderpump also have a design company, I believe based out of Vegas. And that's why I always say Nigga Lane, because Lisa Vanderpump's always like, I love Nigga Lane. Did you know Lisa Vanderpump loves Nigga Lane? I can't believe that. And I always joke that Lisa Vanderpump has a secret relationship with Nick, with Nick Lane, which now that I'm thinking about it, season 11 would just blow up if all of a sudden Nick Lane and Lisa Vanderpump, I, I, I dare even put it out there into the ether, into the universe. But can you imagine? Did you know they saw in the jacuzzi with Nicolet? I can't believe that. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, so we had like the closing party of that, which was just, I was just relieved that Lisa didn't try to like blow it up for the insurance money because we all know, I mean, all you pumpers that have been here forever, we know there's always been some shady stuff with Lisa's restaurants. And there's always been like, there was a fire in the kitchen at four in the morning. I don't even know. It always seemed like weird things. And so we would always joke that Lisa was potentially trying to burn the restaurants down for insurance money. And then last season, when Katie and Schwartz were having the fight in the Sir Alleyway, and then Rick, Rachel came out and was like, Katie, talk to me. And Katie's like, leave me the fuck alone. Do you remember? There was like a big cage of propane tanks. And I was like, that can't be safe. How are we keeping a cage of propane tanks literally out in an alleyway? Like I could, I, I've walked up to those. There's no reason that me, Ryan Bailey, should be able to have the freedom or the power to walk up to a cage of propane tanks right behind the Sir restaurant. Like, what, what if I threw a fucking match in there? Are you kidding me? It's right there. And that also led me to believe that, like, Lisa wants Ryan Bailey to potentially walk up to this thing and just, you know what I'm saying? It's just wild. So we had the we had all of these little scenes. Uh, Sheena did a Screamo version of Good as Gold. Normally, if I saw that, I would be on top of the moon. But for some reason, and maybe it's something going on in my own personal life, I don't know. Did it did it fill you with joy? Did, did, it, did it give you a bliss, this episode? I think what it is too, is just, I can't see really any way out of this. I don't mean life, but I mean, out of like, I just, you know, Tom and Ariana, that's not going the other, you know what? Sorry to just, I know I haven't even done any kind of introductions and all that, but I'm just getting into it. Cause I'm, I've, I've waited all day to do this. You know what it is? It, it's also, I was thinking about breakups, 
I was thinking about certain breakups or things like that. It'll happen. And usually it will make somebody realize how deeply they love that other person and fight to get them back. And Sandoval is definitely like never tried once. Like that's how much Tom Sandoval's mind was made up. And I just want to also, uh, you know, maybe point that out to you guys also shows how little Ariana was prepared for this. So when everybody's bitching and moaning about how much Ariana has, just remember Tom in his head for at least seven months prior, probably longer, had it so set in his head that when this bandaid was finally ripped off, he didn't rip it off, by the way, he got busted. He got caught. He was like, fuck, no, I don't want to go back with her. Are you fucking kidding me? No, fuck, I love... And then it's like, I love Rachel. It's, I love Raquel. I love Raquel. No, you don't. You were just... You're t- dig- it's just... God, thank God Rachel went to that facility. Thank God she got sober. Thank God all of these things happened. Um, but that's another thing, you know? It's like Ariana truly was shocked, whereas Tom had this deep in his head. That's how much Tom truly it feels like in retrospect, disliked Ariana that once he did have that out, there was no way he was going back. There was no way he was like, well, I talked to Howie Mandel and it seems like I was a real idiot and you actually are a great person. Like none of that came out. And I find that so interesting. And that's the other thing too, is that both of them probably, right. They're going to be better off without each other. I mean, who know Tom, I, uh, he probably is convincing himself he's happy or like, but it's, it's, it's weird. It's weird watching or feeling like part of an audience where we were all angry last season, but now it's kind of like, Oh man, like sometimes if something bad happens in your life, you can use that as an opportunity to, um, to become stronger. But for Tom so far, it reads, and I, I don't even mean so far, I mean, even on that Nick vile podcast, which I keep thinking about, uh, is that it just seems like it made him angrier and it made him more strong in his resolve that somehow he was right. Give it another year and this guy will not be sorry for anything at all. Like he will literally not be, it'll be like, no, no, this, it, it happened exactly how I wanted it to happen. This is exactly, I, I always knew I wanted to do it this way. Like it's, I don't know. It's weird. It's weird. I've thought, so, I've thought way too much about this. But I'm so curious. That's why I wish this was a call-in show because I would love to know what you guys think and what you guys think so far. Now, the ratings are still still really huge. And remember, so the ratings were huge night of for episode one. And then when you when you added the, the seven-day ratings into it, it was over like 3.3 million. It was unheard of, unheard of ratings. Now, this had a little bit of a dip. Usually the second episode of any series will have a dip. It had a dip. It had that expected dip in ratings, but nothing crazy. It's still top rated show on Bravo. I will say the new Below Deck got really good ratings. Nothing near Vanderpump Rules, but really strong ratings. Below Deck always sails under the radar. Everybody watches it. Nobody really talks about it online. You don't see a lot of memes made from it, but everybody watches it. And that's kind of a nice, that's kind of nice to have there. Like we all don't need to get our like panties in a bunch about Below Deck. It's kind of that show where like, yeah, man, I watch it. It's cool. I don't need to talk about it. It's cool. (laughs) <laughs> which by the way, I think actually that's under, I think the brilliant watcher crappens they do below deck and uh, which by the way, if you're going to the crappy awards, I will be presenting. I don't know if I'm, I think I'm allowed to say it by now. Anyways, I'll be at the crappy. So if anybody's out there would love to say hi and, and uh, see what you think about Vanderpump rules this season. Anyways. So really strong ratings, especially when you had Peacock DVRs, all of that stuff, which uh, is awesome. The other thing, I noticed today was when I was taking notes, I noticed that every, the the past two episodes have been 42 minutes in length. And you're like, Ryan, what does that matter? They're all 42 minutes in length. No, because I have like this weird, beautiful mind. And I'm so used to watching Bravo shows on Peacock now that I remember every Vanderpump rules last season, except for the extended versions were 43 minutes. So they shaved a minute off the first two episodes. Every episode last season, 43 minutes. First two episode seasons this year, 42 minutes. So Ryan, what does that mean? You're asking. Um, Well, that means they're selling an extra minute of advertising. That's what that means. That's what that means. Because they are able to sell a premium ad rate for Vanderpump Rules season 11 because they know it is as good as gold. 
And so they have shaved a minute off Vanderpump rules this season. Now let's see if my theory holds true the rest of the season. Uh, if it continues to be 42 minutes, because that gives them an extra minute of advertising when they do Bravo, which by the way, did anybody, so a lot of people watch it on Peacock. I, I watch it on both. I watched it on Bravo on Tuesday night and they did like, um, they did a built-in advertisement for Madam Web, the new Dakota Johnson, like Spider-Man movie that's coming out, which kind of, I think looks terrible, but we, I mean, I think we all, I like Dakota Johnson. I like Sydney Sweeney, all that stuff, but it looks terrible, right? It looks, it doesn't look good. Anyways, Bravo has done these amazing things since the beginning of time where they'll put like certain cast members. Like I remember Real Housewives of Atlanta did like Dr. Strange in the multiverse of madness. I think with like, it was wild. It was like Kenya or something like that. <laughs> It's like Dr. Strange. It was so bizarre. I remember one, I think it was Real Housewives of Orange County. Tamara and Shannon did one for a Terminator movie. And you're like, Ryan, there's no way. But some of you remember exactly what I'm talking about. And it's always really startling because there's no way in hell that I believe that Shannon Bedore is potentially watching a Terminator film. You know what? I'm going to take that back immediately, actually, because I do know Shannon Bedore's favorite bands are like Poison and Guns N' Roses and things like that. And Guns N' Roses did do a soundtrack song on Terminator 2. Anyways, neither here nor there. But anyways, they did an advertisement for Madam Web, and it was Tom Sandoval and Tom Schwartz in the advertisement. And I guess the thing of Madam Web is that she can like see the the future or something or like relive uh, some bullshit like that. And I think it was like Sandoval was like, dude, is there ever any time that you could go back and change? So you could change your future. And then these doofuses started using examples of like the tattoos they got in Vegas and not the obvious one of like, Oh, I wouldn't have fucking cheated. <laughs> Which that, you know what? I would actually be like, I would go see Madam web the first day. If Tom Sandoval did a Madam web commercial where he was like, if I could have seen the future, dude, I might not have like cheated. I would have just been honest to Ariana in the beginning. I'd be like, one ticket sold. I'm seeing Madam Web, baby. Did any you guys, some of you guys must have seen that. And also everybody fast forwards through commercials, but sometimes let it play because you're going to see some weird shit. Shit that's going to turn your face green, knock you off your coal mining ass. I've seen a lot of comments lately of like, this is going to be the last season of Vanderpump Rules. No, it's just not. I'll bet you, I'll bet you. I'll bet you three thousand dollars. I mean, I'll bet you what I have in bank account. I'll bet you that it will definitely continue. And just because, even at its weakest, which we've seen in seasons eight and nine, they're still able to charge a decent ad rate. And with the budget, all of this stuff, they will definitely be doing another season. Who knows after that? But they will definitely be doing a season twelve. Period. Tuh. Um, okay. Uh, some quick notes for the show. <laughs> we're already 18 minutes. Hey, just some quick notes for the show. I'll put a timestamp if you want to skip right to the recap, you guys. Um, uh, tomorrow or tonight, Thursday night, I'm going to be hosting a Q&A, a talk back for a movie called Love Reconsidered at the Lemleys in Encino, which is very close to Dorit's Buca de Beppo, uh, Dorit's room at Buca de Beppo. Uh, I was asked to host this Q&A for a producer and casting director that I've worked for before. And guess who won, guess who's the star in this, one of the stars of this film is Luke Goldbrinson from Summer House. And I watched it today and it's actually a really cute movie. And I got to tell you, Luke's a really good actor. He kind of plays a spacey character. I mean, he, he was uh, surprisingly good. I actually LOL'd at Luke, he was very, I thought it was great. So if anybody's in uh, Los Angeles, the Valley, not Jax's the Valley, but the Valley, uh, love reconsidered. I think the screening is at like 7 p.m. tomorrow at Lemley's in Encino. And then I'll be hosting the talk back afterwards. And I got to tell you, stuff like that, that's my dream, man. That is my dream to do things like that, you know, because I do get a little nervous about it. I watch the movie. I try to study. I try to do good. And that's the kind of stuff that I always dreamed about doing. Like I would go to those things. Uh, I, I still go to those things and I always, man, like, I just want to be one of the people asking questions or, or part of it. So it's really exciting to be doing things like that. Um, I did the Jeff Lewis live after show today. First time with Jamie Kennedy. Uh, it was really fun to uh, work with him and I laughed a lot. Jeff Lewis is going to be participating in speed dating next week. And uh, we got to uh, laugh a lot about that. So that was very exciting. So, hey, chumps out there. Thanks for listening. 
And uh, let's see what else. Oh, there was something else. Oh, yeah. I'm so proud of the shows this week. We had Sophie Ross for the Pop Culture Roundup. Tuesday, we had Francesca Farago, which I thought was a great conversation. Um, and we did a Grammy recap. And then yesterday, I was really proud of the interview with Olivia Marie Plath from Welcome to Plathville. You know, there's just certain people that you really root for. And I just, I, I was, I had so many nice comments about that interview. And I felt really good when I put it out. Like there's certain interviews you you, you do, you guys, where you're like, oh, that just felt, that felt good. Like, I don't know how it's going to be received, but it just felt good to do. And that was one of the ones, because there's not a lot of times where I just feel good after I do something. Um, and that one felt good. So it was nice that actually people uh, seem to enjoy that. And I just, uh, I really root for her. And she seems like she's making all the right decisions to set herself up for a really great life. And so you kind of like, oh man, I want to, you, you you try to really support those people. So I think that's worth listening to and definitely worth watching the show if you would have not started yet. Um, and if you like this show and all the work that goes into it, please consider giving it a five-star rating on Apple podcasts and Spotify. And also I want to thank Sandra Fryer, who I work with because she really, uh, I said, I wanted to interview, um, Olivia a while back and she didn't give up. She kept reaching out to her, kept reaching out to her, kept reaching out to her. And it wasn't like she was, she was being ignored, but she really didn't give up on that. And that is just, it's so great. You know, she just did such great work because it's so hard sometimes, you know, you, you receive a lot of no's or you'll put a lot of like lines out there, like you're fishing and you don't get a lot of bites. And, uh, I was just really, um, proud of her that she kept with that and we got it and it turned out to be good. So Sandra, if you're listening, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And now on to the, well, that's it. Okay. You know what? I, that, that's it. Somebody, I, I was at a, I was in a work meeting with Betches today. Um, and I was talking to Sean who works over there and he's just such a great guy and has such a great wealth of knowledge about all of this. But, uh, he was asking or they're doing with all their shows, like mission statements, like what's the mission statement of the show. And I've been thinking about it today and you know, so many, I'm obviously, uh, not succinct and, uh, things are a little stretched out in terms of my thought process and my way of talking. But, you know, my first thing and how it's always been with this show from the first episode until now is be proud of what you love, of what you like. Don't let people shame you into saying it's like stupid. It's a waste of time. Lean into all of this stuff. Like how many times have people kind of rolled their eyes at you when you said what shows you liked or what music you liked or what you like to read or why any of that stuff. And the, the whole thing about this show is like, F that screw that. No, no, we see that these shows are great. These shows can be great. These shows can be so funny. They can actually have some meaning behind it. They actually make us relate to our own lives. It holds a really messed up mirror to the world. And, and at the end of the day, though, we can really just laugh at these shows. So that was always one mission of this. And I think the second one is to try to build some sort of tiny community or just the, the fact that like, hey, I'm a person that exists. I'm going through shit. You're out there. You exist. You're going through shit. Um, let's acknowledge that. Let's be aware of that. And then let's put all of you know our sadness or anger and all that stuff into talking about these things that we love. And uh, this has always been a two-way conversation. It just always consider me the one that is really annoying and over-talking your amazing thoughts because you're all having them in your head. It's just that I don't get to hear them. So just consider it that. So that's what I was thinking about. Uh, and also my dad texted me today, you guys. Uh, he got back from Ohio and he said, uh, what, let me see. He's, this was great. This was actually so cute. Um, he goes, David and I listened to your pop, my uncle David. Uh, David and I listened to your podcast last night. The one with the lady from Cincinnati, Sophie, right? Anyway, she's right about Skyline Chili. It uh, d it doesn't taste better in Cincinnati than the one in, it does taste better in Cincinnati than the one in Columbus. There's one near grandma. And the last time I was in Columbus, I ate there, did not care for it to quote Sheldon. Fun fact. Love you. One of his favorite shows is young Sheldon. It's that in big bang theory. And one of the characters from big bang theory is actual young Sheldon. Go figure. Anyways, I was just like, I can't believe you guys listened. And then he goes, we were really bored. <laughs> Perfect. Bill Bailey. Yes. Okay. Enough about all this crap. Let's get into the mess. This is Vanderpump Rules Season 11, Episode 2, The Ultimate Betrayal. And this is the description 
that Peacock gives us. Tom Sandoval returns to Los Angeles just in time for his birthday. That's it. That's the only description they give. It really sounds ominous, but I think it was the way I was reading it. Just in time for his birthday. It's like just in time for the ultimate destruction. Also, I do think this title is completely tongue in cheek because the ultimate betrayal happened last year when Tom cheated on his nine year relationship with Rachel. Like that was the ultimate betrayal. And that's why I think this is tongue in cheek. And also, no matter how hurt DJ James Kennedy is and calling it, it was the ultimate betrayal, Tom. It wasn't something that Tom Sandoval did directly to DJ James Kennedy. I'm not saying enough for Sandoval. I'm literally just saying. DJ James Kennedy, you're right. Tom Sandoval doesn't really give a shit about you, except that you are a key element to making this show a success. And also, you guys, like I said last episode, and I've said a couple of times before, there's a lot of things going out there about DJ James Kennedy. A lot of people talking about certain things or certain things that might come out. Like I said last week, and I've said before, I have been privy to information in the past. Um We'll see what happens with said information about DJ James Kennedy. And I guess my question in my head is, do people, you know, can people change? Like we see DJ James Kennedy right now. And like we said, you know, by default, he has turned into the number one guy in the group by default. But like a lot of people keep saying, Lisa Vanderpump included, that all of these people have created, you know, such bad sinners, all of them. And when I say all of them, I mean, mean I mainly mean the men. Um, but can people change? Like if stuff comes out of DJ James Kennedy, what would be a line in the sand for you guys as an audience? What would what would it take for you to be like, well, fuck that guy. That's all bullshit. And uh, I will say, too, is that Allie Luber, DJ James Kennedy's, oh, beautiful Allie, you're so beautiful, the love of my life, equine, very equine, like a beautiful horse. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, she seems so sane. Am I? Like, she seems sane. Like, she seems like she makes the right decision. Like, so much so that I'm almost trying to see DJ James Kennedy through her eyes. Like, DJ James Kennedy... If you already dislike him, you have to admit the guy knows his way around a fucking talking head. When you put that camera on him in a room, like when he had the line at the very end of like, you know, it's a who's who. No, like literally who the fuck are these people? Like that was that was hysterical. But, you know, he definitely has had so many problematic scenes on this show and allegedly things that have happened outside of this show, outside of filming. Um, but with Allie, I'm like, she is so sane that I'm almost like I'm, I'm, it almost, it almost, it doesn't give DJ James Kennedy a pass, but you do got to be like, well, she wouldn't be with a horrible person, right? She seems like she's making the right decisions. She seems like, I mean, is she the DJ James Kennedy whisperer? I don't know. Just, just thinking. But in terms of behavior and things like that, is that. I think deeply flawed people wind up on reality television. And I think there are some examples that totally uh, undercut what I just said. But for the most part, deeply flawed people seem to be, it's like a moth to a flame. Like they, they want to be on reality. Like if you want to be on reality television, there is something potentially broken inside of you to begin with. Um, there is, I mean, it kind of, it, 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 I think highlights some of the worst aspects of your character. The camera will find the worst aspect of your character and completely exploit that, or it will change you like the actual, you know, if you are on a successful reality show, you're not going to be unchanged by the experience. And the other question to you guys is, do you want to just see a bunch of perfect uh, automatons on your screen? I think the answer is no. I was I was reading a bunch of stuff about the Real Housewives of Salt Lake City, the new cast members. And there's already a bunch of like, they've already discovered some people making like anti-trans, potential racist comments. One of the new cast members, another com uh, another new cast member allegedly runs a bot account 
um, which is kind of what Monica Garcia did in a sense, which I'm like, fuck, bring Monica back and just have a season of people that run fake accounts under names and talk shit about people. Just do a whole season of that or do like a like a uh, like a season of the traders where it's just uh, housewives characters that run bot accounts trashing other housewives characters. But like the thing is, usually if the show does its job right, that will come out in the wash. That will be highlighted is the shit that they talk. So I don't know. Like, I just think at this point, you're not going to find, you're not going to find perfect people. And I don't think we want to watch that. I think if anything, it can be a cautionary tale to us of not how to behave in certain circumstances. So anyways, last week's episode, we ended with Tom Sandoval walking into his home alone. And he was like, hello, hello, what's up? Anybody home? So we start this week's episode with the new titles, uh, you know, the drone shots into something about her with the theme song playing and then over into Tom Tom with the Toms. And then that takes us into Sir, which we are now two episodes in and we have not seen Sir at all. And I'm just curious if we're going to see Sir at all this season. And I made this meme last night, but justice for Peter Madrigal. Peter Madrigal, the only person that actually truly works at Sir, has now not been in the first two episodes of Vanderpump Rules. What happened to this poor guy? And everybody, I made that post and everybody's like, no, I saw him last week when I went in there for dinner. I'm like, okay, great. He's for working. Why is he not in the show in some way? I almost thought he was going to pop out of like the fridge at Tom Sandoval's sad birthday party at the end. Like, the, the, I mean, did, did Peter like be like, this is this is too crazy for me. I do not want to do this. I just I'm a simple manager and that's all I want to do. Please let me do that. I just am worried. This place was this show was all based around sexy, unique restaurant. And we are neither seeing sexy nor unique nor restaurants at all this season. And I'm just nervous. Can somebody out there tell me if we see Sir at all this season? Because it would be such a damn shame. So we begin this week's episode. We jet on over. We see like the valley. We see people running. We see a train for some reason. And we are in the valley, the beautiful, sunny, sunny valley. And we go over to Tom Sandoval and Ariana's house in Valley Village. And we go into what looks like a bomb shelter. And then as we get further into it, we see that it's Ariana's room. Now, I'm guessing <laughs> it seems like the closet must be kept uh, outside of these bedroom doors where Tom lives, because it seems like potentially everything that Ariana owns is not in a closet. It is hanging off every uh, available area space in this room on the bed, on the dresser, on the ground. I'm truly like, and I feel like at this point, Rachel might be on the show. She's just buried under all of these clothes. Like, I'm just like wondering if Laura Lee is going to pop up. She was like, ah, oh, I've been buried under all these sweaters. Help me, help me. It's really, it's really disturbing. And that's when everybody's like, Ariana has not been affected uh, by this at all. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Look at her bedroom. She's not doing well. Come on. Look at this. She's so, like, that's like her bedroom is the inside of my mind. Like that is literally just my mind is just like Ariana, just junk everywhere. Clothing, old Navy jeans, all of that shit. So we see this and we see this and Ariana's getting ready in the bedroom, in the bathroom. And she looks great, even though she's like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. And then we go over to Tom's sad room and he's just under the blanket. We see luggage outside and a toilet flushes and just Tom walks out. I just I I would have loved if we had a fart. I just like <laughs> Tom just walks out of the bathroom <laughs> or like a light a match or like spray. Anyways, he goes downstairs and we meet uh, one of the hardest working people in show business and uh, Tom Sandoval's uh, assistant. And he's like, what's up, man? What's up, dude? And I don't know if she's like responsible for cleaning the kitchen on top of everything else, but she's like cleaning and she's like, good morning. Uh, how was New Zealand? And he's like such a grueling experience, dude. Like probably like one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. And he lets us know uh, that he said he just got done filming a competition reality show. He must not be able to say the name of the show special forces on this. I watched every episode. Well worth it. We see a clip of him in New Zealand where he's just looking at like dirty mountains and he's like, Oh, amazing dude. So he's just saying like, Oh, I just came back from a grueling experience. I found myself these fat past few months 
like on the receiving end of more hate than I ever got in my entire life. And they freeze frame or they don't freeze frame, but they put a bunch of like tweets or like comments up. And I'm, I'm just, once again, I'm so offended. Like I don't ever get chosen like any kind of piece of my podcast to like start off an episode or none of my, none of my bad memes make it onto this show, but all of these people, we got Bruno reality saying, and to think Sandoval used to be my favorite. Never again. Cindy L four, seven, six, six, two, eight, nine, four, nine, zero, zero says what a tool. I always love people with 30 numbers in their username. And it's always like, you're a piece of dirty shit. Cindy, 8 billion numbers. Uh, Sunshine.Sparkle says, trash human being. Cheaters are never to be trusted. Lisa better watch out. What is that? What is that supposed to mean? Like, Tom's going to fuck Ken? I can't believe it. Tom fucked me all the jacuzzi last night. I can't believe it. Oh, hell me. <laughs> Lisa better watch out. I think Lisa knows who these people are by now. Uh, Chico Chelsea 33 says such a narcissist. Ariana is way better off without him. Uh, Tyler B underscore 25 says Sandoval smells like cheap cologne, wet dog and vodka. That seems like this is somebody that slept with Tom Sandoval because how would he, how would this person, how would Tyler underscore 25 know that he smells like the combination of these three things. So anyways, like he's like, I've been on the receiving end of so much. I, I couldn't handle it. And I need to handle the things that life throws out me, but I also wanted to punish myself penance through pain. And so that's what he's saying. He did the reality show for, he fails to mention the large paycheck he got. It was a punishment to himself. I also want to throw out there that he was probably cast on this show um before full like i mean conversations were probably already happening because remember schwartz was already doing mission to mars uh on fox as well so uh i, I think that was already kind of a done deal but fox really probably were so thrilled that they got tom and it was good i, I really enjoyed the show so he was like uh and i'm going i was going to um i was going to work out uh and i get this Anne, she just smiles she's like yeah. Um, he's like, and then um Jason is gonna come by. Uh, and she's like, okay, okay. This poor Anne, you just feel for her so badly, you know. Ooh. Anne has that smile. I think we've all had that job where we felt like we've had like our boss comes around and we're like, hey, buddy. <laughs> you know, this is great. I'm loving, I'm loving working here. You could just, I mean, she's just smiling. And by the way, this is pain through penance, not fucking special forces. And Anne is doing uh penance through pain. Like Anne is literally like every day she had to glue that penis flute back together. She has to blow up balloons for Tom's uh birthday party. It's just like hit after hit for Anne. But Tom's come down, he's like, um, Jason's going to come by dude. And then I haven't seen Schwartz, but I have to, um, I have to see him cause I got him new running sneakers. And Anne's like, Oh, um, you know, you haven't seen him in a while. And she's smiling. Everything she says, she's smiling. And I cannot wait for the moment we see on this show where Anne smiles, like just goes away and goes, fuck you, dude. Because here's my theory. I said this last week, but I want to remind people, this is my theory is that, on Nick Vile's podcast, Schwartz said Sandoval's assistant quit like the week before they recorded that podcast. Everybody assumed it was Anne, but Anne has this podcast with another person called like We Signed NDAs or something like that. I have not listened to it. Uh, a great place to actually get um, podcast recaps. One of my favorite accounts, Vanderpod Recaps on Instagram. Uh, she does the Lord's work because by the way, her job is just getting, she basically just listens to all of these podcasts and takes detailed notes on everything Vanderpump rules related, but it's becoming a little fucking ridiculous. Not her job, but like the amount of Vanderpump rules podcasts or people that are talking about the podcast. So all of a sudden there used to be a handful of podcasts she's covered. And now there's like 8 billion pot, like Billy Lee has another podcast where Tom Sandoval was her first guest, which is just. Oh man, it's just, oh, we're back in the thick of it, man. I, I mean, I would pay good money for people to stop doing Vanderpod. I, I listen, listen, if, if any of the, like, if, 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 if Sandoval burped in your general direction, it means you need to start a podcast now. Anyways, he's like, oh, you know, this is what I got going today. It's, um, it's pretty crazy. And 
she just like, okay, okay, great. Uh huh. Uh, yeah. Okay. And then he's like, um, uh, I don't know if me and Schwartz are okay. Things are very much not okay with Schwartz and I, he just recently went on Jackson's podcast and talked shit about me, dude. And then we hear it. I know he's very passionate about the band, but like the optics of it, just like he doesn't give a shit, dude. He's like living out his rock star dream. And then Santa was like, I just feel betrayed by my friend, dude. And I remember like, I actually listened to that podcast. And this is where Sandoval seems to still be getting it wrong. Beat after beat is that Schwartz fucking just, he can go on any pod. Like Schwartz took it easy on Sandoval has taken it easy on Sandoval. Schwartz could have blown this guy out of the water and he just, because remember Schwartz did invest a half a million dollars potentially into Schwartz and Sandy's and he had every right to be mad. He, you should be kissing Schwartz's ass every day. You should be buying him 10 pairs of shoes that he didn't completely end you during that. Like, I remember that podcast thinking like, okay, you know, people were like, oh, he really gave it to him. No, he didn't. He didn't at all. And the fact that Sandoval just isn't in that talking head going, listen, I deserved it. I deserved it. I can't imagine what he was feeling on his, his end having to go through this. Now, of course, we're leaving out the fact that Tom Schwartz knew literally the day after uh, that he hooked up with, with Rachel. Like he knew the next day. So when Schwartz even talks about later in this episode that Sandoval put them all in this bad position because uh, that he did this and they own a business together, put everybody in a bad position. Schwartz, you put everybody in a bad position too. If we're going by the same metrics, of course, Sandoval wins, but you did that as well because you had the knowledge the whole time. You could have said, shut it the fuck down, but you kept it going. And in fact, you kind of made it your own little storyline, your little flirtation with Rachel when you knew the Rachel Tom shit was going on. So it's funny, like Schwartz kind of escaped persecution on that as well with the other, the other owners. I don't know. Anyway, Sandoval's to Anne. He's like, oh, anyway, dude, uh, tomorrow's my birthday. He's like, and Anne is like, oh yeah, happy birthday. Happy birthday. Thanks, dude. I just wanted to have like some people over. Uh, she's like, um, <laughs> he's like, Ariana's obviously invited to come if you want to come. We see Ariana upstairs and then we go back and Anne's like, I think she'll be busy. Yeah, I figured, dude. Um, she can ask if she wants to stay in a nice hotel. That'd be really nice, Tom. I can get her a nice hotel room. Uh, she can rent porn or anything she wants. And anyways, Anne texts and goes, hi, sorry to bother you, but Jason is coming over to hang with Tom in a bit and I think you'll be in the gym. Uh, and then Tom's like, anyways, I'm going to go up and work out. Peace. And Anne just smiles. And Ariana's like, okay, I won't be here. I'm going to take my out, their dog. And then she's like, sounds great. And it's just really awkward. So then Ariana comes down and Anne, as this, this point has just got to be like, there's got to, like, I'd rather, I could work at like a Wendy's. Producer goes, what's it like having to share a living space with your ex? And Ariana goes, it's stupid. And Sandoval's like, it's awkward. And then Ariana like, he has, he's done some weird things. Like he went through my mail and put plates, put my plates on my car and I, I read some people in comments going, I would kill for somebody that put plates on my car. Would you kill for somebody that cheated on you for seven months? And by the way, that's the one we know about. Would you kill for that? Just be, would that be the trade off for you? It was like, he did put the plates on my car. Now, having been one of those people that have like waited six months to put my plates on the car, like I, I do, I, my initial reaction was that's nice. And then I thought about it, then I thought about it. It was like, you know what? On second thought, you know what? The, probably the not cheating, but I don't, anyways, I love that this was that. And then also she says that his most recent thing is that he, he has a little noise machine, uh, a little, you know, that makes like, like probably like rainforest sounds or white noise. He puts it out in front of whatever room he's in. And Sandoval's like, it's because dude, um, she had people over that were overhearing what I said. And it doesn't really allude to more than that. So like, I'm imagining then like Dodie went on a podcast and said what he said, but it's like, first off, maybe don't say the stupid shit when everybody's over. But I love that now he puts the white noise machine and Ariana's like, is this some kind of like torture tactic or something? Is it like, and I will say you, you, that happens during like wartime. There was one, uh, I forgot what war it was, 
but they played uh, Neil Diamond's Sweet Caroline on repeat for like weeks on end. I love that song. So that would have been fine for me. But I was like, dude, the white noise is nothing. If he really wanted to fuck you up, he'd play his album. Um, Kidding. Very talented. But I do think and then we see his little white noise machine when he works out. And I think that's it with Tom. Like (sighs) Tom, instead of actually dealing with his problems, he just wants one big gigantic noise machine around him. Like he can't, he, he needs that white noise machine. Like it's so symbolic of everything. He's going to try to drown all of this out. He's going to try to drown all of this out and never actually really potentially consider what actually happened. Instead, it's going to drown all the noise out and just get more and more angry about everybody that got angry about his own actions. Right. Make sense. So Ariana comes down and this poor Anne, you can already tell she's nervous with Sandoval, nervous with Ariana. And you got to imagine that Anne knows that Sandoval fucked up and is collecting a paycheck. And I got to tell you, living in Los Angeles is pretty hard. I don't know Anne, even though she does really look familiar. I'm curious if she like took classes at Upright Citizens Brigade or Improv Olympic because she looks so familiar to me. And I, I do not know why. I think I've bumped into her in like my, like in the past in my real life before any of this madness. But anyways, uh, you know, she's following Ariana like, Hey, hi. Cause she has to now ask about the stupid party and she knows how this is going to go. Right. So Ariana's like taking Maya out and she's like, sorry, this is so awkward. Um, um, so Tom wants to have a birthday party here tomorrow. Um, and Aria's like, okay. Um, he said that, uh, he, <laughs> he could get you a very nice hotel room. Um, and Ariana's like, that's not happening. Okay. 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 I think that's very disrespectful and inappropriate. If he wants to have a party, he can have it somewhere else. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then she does a thumbs up. She does a thumbs up. Like, got it. Okay. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. And then Ariana continues. And if there are people here, I will call the cops. If they are making noise, people here, I will call the cops. And Anne's like, okay, great. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. That that's perfect. Yep. No, that's great. That's exactly what. Okay. Totally. Okay. Now let's talk about this. Is Oriana being irrational? Is she being unreasonable? And it's not tit for tat, but I mean, the obvious argument here was Tom being irrational, unreasonable when he pulled all this shit. Remember, he fucked Rachel in their driveway. Uh, you know, it the, the seduction started in their backyard and then it moved out to the driveway. Brecken Meyer, the actor from Clueless, lives right next door. He fucked in the driveway and Brecken Meyer from Clueless lives next door. I don't even know why I keep saying that. I just find it fascinating. I mean, just imagine poor Brecken Meyer coming home late night from set and seeing Tom hump and Rachel in a forerunner. Like, that's wild. So Ariana says, I'll call the cops, but think about this. And she goes on to say, I know what Tom's parties are like. I've been there and we've seen what Tom's parties are like. He likes to really cut loose. And this dude is a night owl. He goes all night. He really does. And by the way, if they're great, then that's good. But by the way, even if they're great, I'm sure that got annoying at times, but imagine this, they're just trying to get through their days you know, have a couple people over, but don't have a fucking party because the examples of Tom having parties in a past in the past have been like insane ragers. And so that's kind of what it is. And don't worry, don't feel bad. He ended up getting to have a party after all. So anyway, they're like, good meeting, good meeting, good talk, great talk. So she's like, I'm spiraling thinking about what his parties used to be like and everything that I said. So I think she has every right to say, no, I don't want that. And also the fact that Tom even asked to check doesn't make him a nice guy. It means he already knows that it's kind of weird. Remember, he just got back home from special forces. We're three months after the scandal. And I, I do have to remind everybody listening. Tom allegedly is part owner in two fucking bars on top of, he has a good connection at Sir and a good connection at Pump. If he really wanted to throw a rate, yes, it's not the comfort of his own home, but he's not drinking. He can rage anywhere, right? Like, I mean, seriously, have it at Schwartz's apartment for the love of God. I mean, at this point, or like Jason, his drummer, manager, podcast co-host, he could step off and op- open up his house. 
I think this is one of those things that on its face is meant to make Ariana look bad because I think we all would know what her reaction would be as well as Tom knowing what her reaction would be. Um, so anyways, everybody's going to have their thoughts about this, including La La later on in this episode, but that's kind of how I see it. And the scene awkwardly ends because uh, Anne's like, uh, he's going to have Jason come over in a second. And uh, Ariana's like, you know what? I'm just going to keep existing as I normally do in my own house. Okay. And Anne's like, okay, great. That's amazing. <laughs> no, that's a great answer. I love that. I love that. And yes, that's uh, obvious, but all the, I, I, you know, spoiler alert. You know, Anne loves Ariana. In fact, if you go to her Instagram account, she literally is wearing like a team Ariana cheerleader suit when Ariana is doing Dancing with the Stars. So they're OK. And I think Ariana understands the weird position that she is in. But also uh, Ariana nor Tom at this point are thinking about Anne. You know, they're thinking about themselves and the pain that they're going through. Uh, you know, Ariana, the pain that Tom caused her and Tom about the pain that we all caused him, not that he caused himself. The scene ends with Anne walking up the stairs going, it's, it's just so weird. It's just so weird. Anne literally is the voice of the audience because we're watching this going, it's just so weird. It's just so weird. And the thing is, we know there's real no resolution to this. Tom on the after show, Tom on Nick Vial, Tom, whenever he's asked about it, is like, all we want is gotta get her shit together, dude. She's not paid bills in eight months, dude, which there's a reason for that as well. So we now jet on over to Villa Rosa with Hanky and Panky and we go inside. Uh, Lisa's getting her hair done and the guy's like, you know, what are, what are we doing tonight for the celebration? He's like, it's not a celebration. It's just the last night. If anything, it's like commiseration, you know? Oh. He's like, 10 years is a good run for a restaurant. I'm telling you, it's a success story. Yes, the end of an era. In a talking head, after 10 years, we've decided to close pump. It's bittersweet. The rent's going up and it's going to be exponentially more expensive. And Kin's looking to retire. If you're really smart, sometimes it's good to know when to walk away. If we take it on for another 10 years, that means Kin will still be stomping the pavements of West Hollywood into his 80s. And I'll be in my 40s. Oh, that is way too old. Nick Elaine, I love you. Anyway, she tells the hairdresser, it's had so many great memories. I'm going to miss it. Should we absolutely get shit-faced and carry it out? So they're all just laughing. And I just know the like undercurrent of that scene is like Lisa. She's like, I didn't find a way to blow it up for insurance money. She also says the rent's going up. Now, if you look into this, there was a lot of back and forth between, I think, the people that actually do own that property saying that they were not paying their rent. Uh, go check that out. I don't know how it all ended. I don't know how restauranteering works. I'm sure if you have a lot of... And also, the kin stomping the pavement, they still do own multiple restaurants. So this man is going to be stomping the pavement into his 80s. God willing. Ken, if anything happens to you, I swear to God, I love that man with all of my heart. I tell you, like at this point, only one person on Vanderpump Rules I want a picture with, and that is Ken. I love that. I, that man needs to be protected at all costs. All he does is carry dogs around on his little nook, Run, you know, just walks into scenes and creates magic and talks about jacuzzis. It's just like, he's just, to me, he's amazing. He's like Santa Claus to me. So now we cut back we cut into like the deeper Valley over into uh like, like Burbank ish by the airport by Burbank airport. And I know exactly the walking path that DJ James Kennedy and Ali are walking. It's like on Magnolia. It's a beautiful walking path, but they're walking, getting their exercises, raising their blood pressure. And they start like out of nowhere. It's like, I think it's time. I'd like to get a dog. I'd like to get a dog, Ali. I'm ready for a dog. I know like my DJ career is going to get like busier and I'm DJing a lot, you know, but Harry can come watch her whenever. And she's like, I'm not against it, but we just have to make sure we're really ready. Yeah. You know, Lisa asked me about Graham Cracker the other day at TomTom Tom, and we flash back to that. She's like, what happened to your dog? When Raquel went to the facility, she's like, I hope he's good, Lisa. So he's telling Allie, I can just picture him in that cactus infested land in Arizona. Oh, I feel like I've never gotten over Graham Cracker. I'm just devastated, but I'm just so long over that. I was always just the best dad to Graham. Our bond was undeniable. 
unbreakable. Our love was better than anything in my life. Besides Ali, guys night. Okay, there's a lot of things to mention in this. We tend to rewrite our own histories. We also tend to not really be aware sometimes of our own behavior, things like that. If you listen to Raquel Goes Rogue, um, she talks about that, I think, in the first or the second episode about the graham cracker of it all. And she alludes to the fact that DJ James Kennedy was not a good dog dad. Um, Also, I almost like... (sighs) This feels so on the nose, this scene, knowing that Graham Cracker comes back to DJ James Kennedy and they rename him Hippie. They rename the dog Hippie. But this feels so on the nose that they're at, like, it almost made me feel that they filmed this scene after they got the dog back. Because really, like, DJ James Kennedy was, like, just walking around talking about wanting to get a dog. It could be possible, but, like, the stars really lined up. If DJ James Kennedy was talking about this, Lisa was talking about this. And then this just magically happened. Like, did Lisa already know and hinted the producers and the producer was like, hey, we're going to film you walking. Hey, do you ever think about getting a dog again? Talk about that. Like, it just, how did that all, I mean, that's magic. And Allie, remember, Allie is a cat. He's a proud cat dad now. So DJ James Kennedy's not going to be at the pump because he's DJ and he's like, flying out to Chicago for a sold out show. Pretty good. But yeah, bye bye the pump. Yeah. Bye bye. And now the camera does like some weird flippy motion, like music starts and we jet over. Where do we jet to now, folks? Oh, we're back at Tom and Ariana's dungeon. So uh, Jason, uh, who is Tom Sandoval's drummer and kind of one of his spokesmen and co-hosts the podcast, he comes into the dungeon and he's like, what's up, dude? And I was like, what's up, dude? All right, dude. I wish he had brought Howie Mandel. Remember, uh, Jason's wife it works for Howie Mandel, and that's how Tom got on the Howie Mandel podcast. Anyways, they make some bro jokes. Can I get you some crushed ice or something? He's like, yeah, yeah. You know what? Maybe I could take some crushed ice. All right. Anne's just, Anne's just laughing in the background. He's like, I've lost a lot of long-term friends, dude. So I've le- leaned into the ones that have stuck around, and Jason has definitely been one of those. He's like, how have you been since you got back? He's like, my knees are killing me, dude. He's the manager of my band, uh, very supportive, not only in L.A., but on the road. And it kept me from being in a really bad place. And we see all the photos of them, which is great. I'm glad he has a friend. So he goes, have you heard from Raquel? And he's like, I haven't heard from her, dude, in a few weeks. I just miss her. I just want to see her and give her a big hug with my penis. He's like, everybody's going through stuff, but like uh, you two, you were kind of going through this together, living in this world. Now, to me, this seems like such a, you know, obviously a lot of these scenes are kind of set up, but this is the thing to like, let's, let's reveal, let's remind the audience in the scene that you are going through this with her. So if she's not coming back, she's leaving you in a bad spot and she's a bad person. Right. Um, She's like, yeah, you know, living in this world of like people hating on you, you know? Yeah. Um, still very much in love with Raquel, Tom says in the talking head. I'm hoping that we can give our relationship a real chance. And then Jason's like, uh, how's everything going? Is Ariana here right now? You can tell Jason's like, hey, is Ariana here right now? Oh, shit. The white noise machine drowns her out, I think. No, he's like, oh, she's not here right now, dude. So now we get that little piece of information, that nugget that he's hoping that Raquel and him are good so they can give their relationship a fighting chance. But don't feel bad for Tom. He's already dating, He's dating a new girl. In fact, I one of my friends is in Vegas and Tom was in Vegas tonight at some like bourbon or whiskey event. And they were sending me photos of Tom. I should read you the text because my friend was like, I think he's like rolling right now, which is like referring usually to the, you know, uh, like ecstasy or something, you know, and they were joking and I was like, really? And they were like, well, he's not making any sense when he's doing this interview. And I was like, well, that kind of just sounds like Tom. That doesn't mean he's fucked up, but they were sending me pictures and that new, the model girlfriend was with him as well as Jason from the scene. So that's where he was tonight. So he's doing good. He's getting little opportunities and stuff like that. Like everybody is on the cast. So she's like, I asked if we could have people over for the party. And she was just like, no. 
And then we flash back to that scene. I just talked to Ariana and says, and uh, it's a no for the party. <laughs> He's like, really? Yeah. And then Jason go, is she allowed to tell you that? Like, I feel like, you know, you should be able to have people here. Like, what is she even going to do? And Anne's like, I'm so sorry. Ariana did mention that she may have to um, call the police. (laughs) Yeah, it might not be the best idea. And Jason's like mouth agape to call the police. That is nuts. I bet. I bet this girl doesn't even stock pins and batteries. Oh, my God. I also want to remind people the last time cops were called on a Vanderpump Rules party. Remember that hysterical episode when Randall used his movie connections and called the cops and had uh, Jack's fake arrested and everybody thought it was pretty fucking hysterical except for Katie Maloney was completely in the right and then Schwartz completely yelled at Katie and was like, this is why you're a drag, man. This is why I don't even like being with you, dude such a dark just think about how many dark episodes of vanderpump rules there are that was the last time cops were called and those were fake cops anyways sandoval in a talking head goes obviously ariana is still very upset at me she thinks what i did makes me a criminal but i doubt the police are going to agree with that which would be great if that actually does happen and the police do come and they're like sorry dude it's la we uh we do think that's disgusting. We do think that's, and uh, we really take it hard on reality stars. Fuck that. <laughs> you see, see what we did to Paris Hilton in the early aughts? You're going down, buddy. Uh, and then Tom goes, what if we compromise and have like people out of here by midnight? And Anne's like, um, I'll, I'll tell. And Santa was like, I'm cool with that. And he's like, I'm just, it's people just hanging out for your birthday. Anyways, and now poor Anne Like, this is Anne's worst nightmare, having to now go to Ariana and go, hi, so sorry. So he was wondering if he could have, like, people, but, like, a very small group, maybe 12, and then have have everyone out by midnight, okay? And then she goes, so sorry, exclamation point. So Anne has now said, Ariana's against this, call the cops, and Tom's like, no, it's still pretty cool, dude. We got to do it, dude. And I think I counted more than 12. FYI. So she's like, okay, I texted. Um, and she's like, I got fast thumbs. Sorry. I already texted. And he's like, okay, okay. So, uh, so now we jet over to a scene with Lala and Ariana. They're getting smoothies and, uh, or Lala's like, uh, how's the living situation going with Tom? Yo. And she's like, so tomorrow's his birthday. And today Anne was like, Hey, he wants to have a party here tomorrow. He said he would go get you a hotel. I'm like, "Mm, this is my house. I will be at my house. And Lala's like, right. But I also think that from just like a logical standpoint, he's allowed to have a party at his house. That's true, Ariana says, but I'm also allowed to call the cops for a noise complaint. And Lala's like, but why would you do that? If they're loud and I need to go to bed because I have shit to do the next day, couldn't you say to Anne, just like, hey, it's his birthday and I want him to have the best time, Lala says. Can we just make sure everyone's gone by this time? And did text me and said, well, now he said it's a group of like 12 people and they'll be gone by midnight. And I'm like, that seems fine. And Lala's like, I mean, wouldn't it just be easier to move out? She's like, yeah, sure. When the house is sold. Because I'm not here for him trying to assert his dominance. Be louder, be more obnoxious, make me uncomfortable. And then I cower and let him do whatever. But I think that's where you're maybe not understanding the type of person that he is, Lala says. He's getting off on making you uncomfortable and you sticking around. And Ariana Tugging Head says, you can't sell the house unless both people agree to sell the house. But Tom wants to buy me out and stay there. And I'm not just going to like pack up my clothes and hitchhike down the road because Tom offered me a measly sum of money. I got to have my lawyer go back and say, this is what she wants, Ariana says. And you don't want him to buy you out because you make, it feels like it makes his life easier. And she's like, yeah. Ariana in a talking to says, the fact of the matter is he broke the home. He fucked all this up. He doesn't get to do that. And then just like, I don't know, keep it. Lala says, how does Dan feel about all this? Has he vocalized, why are we still in the house? That's her boyfriend. And I was like, he's like, I'm looking forward to when you get your own space because we've been paying a lot of money when he comes into town to like stay somewhere because they would get like Airbnb things. Lola goes, has he changed your mind about starting a family? 
Ariana's like, he's the first person that I've met that I'm actually like, oh, is that what that would be like? And Lala's like, whoa, zoiks. Ariana's like, I just think he opened my mind and eyes to a lot of different possibilities that I could not see. In retrospect, she says in a talking head, Tom being my partner affected my feelings on having kids a lot more than I thought it did. And then we flash back to all of these scenes of them talking about potentially not wanting kids. Ariana with Lisa, um, them looking at a house, talking about how many kids they want. She says none. Tom says three or four. She says, I feel like with Dan, I have my eyes open to the fact that there are different kinds of partners out there who would actually be a 50-50 partner, a real partner, where if I can only give 10% that day, he's ready to give 90 And Lala goes, how old is he? And he just turned 40. And Lala goes, 40, never been married, has no kids. That makes my nipples hard right now. And then little Lala was like, fuck yeah, dude. My nipples are hard too, yo. What up? I used to do a character last season, little Lala. A lot of people have asked me to do it again. And then some people said, don't do it again. But little Lala's out, yo. I'm little Lala. Little Lala is um, Lala's private parts that talk tougher. It talks tougher than Lala. Lala's always like, oh my God, that makes my butt ju- like that makes my butt pucker up. So little Lala would always speak filthier than Lala does in scenes. Okay, but regardless of any of that mess, I do want to point out Lala, everybody's like, well, she is just really, that's a very clear-headed way to think. I mean, she's kind of got a lot of points there. Okay, sure, maybe. But I also want to point out, this is where... Um, a lot of the the comments can go with like being hypocritical is that give me a fucking break. If we went back a year and a half ago and had this conversation reversed in terms of Randall, remember also Lala, like Randall, literally she was in fear of Randall in fear of leaving. She had to like make a mad dash. She had to like escape that house because she was scared of what he might do. Like, I mean, she had like, But also Lala would fucking like Lala is cutthroat, dude. She's like, you want to get popped or you want to get popped? You want to get popped, bitch? Like, like you want to get popped? Like Lala talks tougher than all of these people combined. So when Ariana's actually putting shit in motion, that's a little tough and uncomfortable. Lala all of a sudden is thinking like with a completely clear head when the shoe is on the other foot, Lala does not sometimes have that way of thinking. And that's the one thing that I wish Lala would actually Um, I, I feel like she wakes up to that fact way after the fact. And then she's like, oh yeah. Okay. Well now I do understand, but I do like, I I think if we're talking about just being petty, I feel like Lala is totally okay with being petty towards Randall and justifiably so, because that guy is a complete douchebag, which by the way, new Randall Emmett information came out today. I think he's getting sued for unpaid bills. So still a lot of shit going down with Mr. Randall Emmett. But I do find it interesting that Lala is trying to be the voice of reason in this situation when we've seen her be very unreasonable. And I think rightfully so. I think Ariana is well within her rights to feel this way. And also in regards to the Dan situation, like it's wild. It's wild. Uh, We talked about this last week. Uh, You know, I think there is maybe potentially a little bit, I don't know. It's not trauma bonding because I don't think Dan has gone through trauma, but I'm really happy if she's happy. I'm really happy if it has opened her eyes that there are other kind of partners and it does make a lot of sense, you know, because she probably would be worried. Tom was that guy that did stay out all night and she didn't think he was, I mean, she truly trusted him, didn't think he was cheating on her, but still it was like, well, how, how would, I mean, your life would completely change. You're out and about all the time. How would that even work? I don't know. So this scene did make sense to me, but I see this is going to cause disruptions down the road in terms of episodes in how Lala uh, reacts to Ariana. And I think what we're potentially going to see is when Schwartz starts like you're not queen b ariana so like i think lala is going to fold into the schwartz camp so now we have fun music like gonna go off and we pull up to pump restaurant for the last time ken and lisa get out and and she's like let's do it one last time and ken's like shuffling oh i'm gonna do one last time all right all right all right and they pull in it's packed pump for the last night 
Uh, she's given a mic. There's like heavy security everywhere because this show is kind of blown up all over again. So everybody's there. If you watch any part of this scene, there is like security flanking each one of these cast members. Anyways, Lisa takes a mic and she's like, I love nigga Lane. You know, she goes, uh, when we opened this 10 years ago, we had a dream of vision to create the most beautiful garden in West Hollywood. And we've had so many moments over the years, moments that will be forever etched in our minds. And we do this kind of flashback of all these beautiful moments, like DJ James Kennedy. Lisa, don't fire me, Lisa. Please give me another chance. No, it would, we actually see really sweet moments, but it would be funny if it was just horrible moments of just all the mess that has gone down at Pump. I have so many good memories at Pump. They make those drinks so fucking strong and they put so much sugar in them. If you want a hangover, Pump was always the place to go. But they play this like really kind of sad, sappy music underneath it. I spent my whole life trying to get this moment. And it is sweet. It, it, it is. We have one moment with that. Lisa's like, Ken, come see my box. Because they're doing a mailbox. But it's a joke about Lisa's private parts. And Ken, we see Ken literally running. He's like, all right, I'm coming. Like, we actually, not mumbling. He's like fully in a light jog to see Lisa's box. And I'm like, oh, Ken, like when he was like just full running, not shuffling. Oh, my God. I love I love Ken when he could run. I love Ken when he shuffles. Just love Ken. And then we're back to her speech. Thank you for being such a support to us, all of you. And it's almost a wrap, so let's fucking party. I'm going to go lit a fireball that's going to blow this whole place up one last time. Yes. And everybody's dancing. Oh, just magic happening at pump. We see a waiter in a tight shirt. Sheena and Lala come in dressed like they're like backup singers for the Black Eyed Peas. Like Sheena's in this tight blue dress lala's in like this blue spangly tom schwartz walks up in a suit katie maloney like big chicken cutlets are being served i don't know ariana walks up and the girls are all sitting at a table like hi oh, you look sexy you look sexy you know that whole bit and then we hear a big cheer and lisa's like schwartz is behind the bar and ariana's like he's bartending here and Katie's like, oh, my God, which, by the way, just to remind everybody, uh, Schwartz is the one person that could never truly work at one of Lisa's establishments. She tried and he barely made it through a shift, remember? And he was like, oh, I can't do it, Matt. Like, imagine that. Like, some people think it's like, oh, it's like sad that Peter actually works at this restaurant. No, what's sad is that Schwartz actually never could. Like, Schwartz tried and couldn't. Schwartz, like once again, like kind of sailed through this, like he never had to pretend like he worked there. Like, I mean, truly the man is like blessed. Like he is touched by some kind of miracle protection. Schwartz is like, I feel much more ease or at this bar. Like than I did like 10 years ago when I had a full meltdown and got like fully flustered. Like I, I've got a lot, a little more chutzpah, you know, I'm a plant dad now. It's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, all right. So Schwartz comes over. Ariana gives him the cold shoulder again. Katie kind of laughs at the whole situ situation. And then uh, Ariana and Katie leave, and Schwartz sits down. He's like, how are you feeling, Lisa? Mixed emotions. If it's not going to carry its own weight, I'm going to have to blow it up. No, I mean, just close it. How is your business? You were lost over there. You're still lost over there. We really got it bad. We had to clean up Tom's mess. He had severely tainted the brand name. My partners don't want to work with him. You know, he's like an absentee partner. Those are the, his words. We did ask Sandoval to step away from Schwartz and Sandy's. And my partners told Tom, if he comes in, they're going to close the doors and he's not welcome there. However, I didn't expect him to just fully check out. I thought it would be like more proactive in terms of like pitching ideas on how to weather this. You know, like... It just kind of, I love that. I love, I mean, I get what Schwartz is saying, but I also love that Schwartz expected Sandoval, like, oh, what's up? Um, here's an idea. Um, fire dancers, right? I heard a whole shitload of fire dancers. I put them in the bar. That's immediately going to attract attention. Oh, here's another idea. Um, I'll, um, 
I'll, I'll cheat with other people that come in the bar. Yeah. I'll cheat. And that, that'll like, um, that's another idea that I'm just coming up with. I'm spitballing here. Oh, or when Rachel's out of that place in Tucson, the therapy place, I'll see if she's willing to cheat with people like customers in the bar. Would that be a cool idea? <laughs> but Schwartz is disappointed in Sandoval that he's not like stepping up and trying, which seems like a lot of people like DJ James Kennedy are disappointed as well. She, he tells Lisa, I, I would use this as a moment to like build up integrity because he jeopardized this entire business. I think it's just time for you to reevaluate your position on everything. I think it's a little unfair to Schwartz to blame Sandoval for the demise of the business. I don't think Sandoval was thinking, oh, I wonder if his takings at Schwartz and Sandy's will go down because I'm shagging my partner's best friend. Well, Lisa, isn't that the fucking point? Isn't that the point, Lisa, is that he wasn't thinking about that when he should have been thinking about that? You're a business owner. You know. Also, Lisa is the only one that does their talking heads, do you notice now, in Sir itself in the front. And she's all like so well lit in the dark light. Like, do you notice that? Everybody else does their talking heads at this like, I think it's like a studio in Burbank. But Lisa doesn't have to schlep out there. She's allowed to do the talking heads uh, at Sir. I, I just thought that was interesting and funny. And she's lit very differently than the others are lit in their talking heads. So Lisa is sticking up for Sandoval in this like already, which is funny. So Lisa's like, before you make any decisions, you've got to tell him how you feel. Like it's some kind of like romance movie. Tell him how you feel, dear boy. And then Sheena's like, what do you think Schwartz and Lisa's talking about over there? And Lala's like, I can't believe you're talking about this while you're doing your little Sheena dance. So Schwartz is like, I, I hear what you're saying. I'm going to do some soul searching, which has got to be like Schwartz doing soul searching just means he's going to take mushrooms. That's what that means. So we come back and we hear good as gold. Uh, I didn't rock for you. I'm going to own the night. I always love hearing good as gold. And we were at a music studio and we all of a sudden hear good as gold, like good as gold, but like a rock emo version. And Sheena and Brock walk into a music studio and I'm like, uh oh, is magic about to happen? Remember those scenes back in the day with Mike Shea in the recording studio? Man, you, when you do think about it, just so much dark, so many dark little moments in the show. Truly, these people have lived a billion lives on this show. And uh, Brock walks in. He's like, I'm feeling very American right now in this studio. Yeah, I'm feeling very American. All right, all right. You guys look good in here. All right. Tina's like, so the first emo night I went to, I was like, hey, TJ, do you think I could do e DJ emo night one night? And he was like, yeah. He's like, what if you and Ariana did it together? And I was like, fuck yeah, let's do it. And I was talking about this in front of Katie. And I was like, do you want to do it with us? Emo night is a huge event, Sheena lets us know, where you get together with your friends, you listen to emo music, and you're like, sad as fuck. It's because you're supposed to be sad as fuck, because it's emo night, but like you're sad as fuck in a happy place. Um, now, emo night is actually a big thing. It's like a big concert experience where you do get to scream along to these emo, emotional, but emo songs, rocky emotional emo songs that are, it's so fun. It's awesome. I do think it's funny that Sheena was like, hey, can I DJ emo night? And the guy was like, sure. But will you also bring Ariana? <laughs> anyway, Sheena's like, I invited Katie to help us rebuild our friendship. So in April, the three of us DJ emo night together and we see a picture and it was so much fun. We were like, we got to do another one. And I asked TJ, what if we had good as gold as an emo screamo cover? So we're just going to like double up some vocals and just do some tweaks, just do some layers and finish up today. And so Sheena is going to get in the booth and re-record a classic. This is like, to me, this, to me, this is like Taylor's version, but like Sheena's version, <laughs> it's like re-recording your greatest hits, but just tweaking it a little bit. So we hear, we see Sheena in the booth, like, Come on, get right in, shoddy. Stop waiting for a sign. Come close and touch my body. Let's have a good time. And she's screaming. And Sheena actually is a pretty good screamer. Like, I was shocked. And everybody's like, oh, my God, so good. That's mute. That's magic. And Brock and the talking head's like, I love this version of my wife. It's sexy. It's inspiring. She was made for the spotlight. And I'm glad she's putting herself out there. Remember, I can't do a Brock imitation, so I just do a little leprechaun. Anyways. Brock's like, what was that? And she's like, I haven't done music since we've been together. 
in the talking head, she says in 2019, the amount of negativity, negativity I got from my last song and the music video, which was the iconic 2019 song, One More Time, which do you remember that music video? Do you remember? I, I'm like looking at the music video and I forgot about Max and Brett, the two new cast members. And it was Brett was in the music video slapping Sheena's ass. And she got into, ugh, I forgot about that, man. Poor Brett. Where's Brett now? Where's Max? Anyways, I just threw in the towel. I was like, you're not the best singer. Don't do music anymore. Let's move on. But everyone loves a good reunion tour. So guess what, bitches? I'm back. So if we're doing this tomorrow night, what about a nanny? We got a nanny for our kid. And Sheena's like, Tori's going to come over tomorrow. My therapist was like, what's the next piece of exposure work that you could work on? And I said, allowing someone else to watch my kid. Since having summer, she says in a talking head there, I assumed there was something wrong with me and it took me a little over a year to open up to anyone about that. But postpartum OCD just attaches to your worst fears and it then shows up in your head. And we see flashbacks of her uh, 10 days earlier going like watching a baby nanny con nanny cam. And she's like, if Summer Moon hops this crib, I'm going to freak out. And Brooke's like, what are you doing? You're a great mom. Why are you watching this? Um, but Sheena, remember, she does have these uh, these issues like postpartum on top of OCD where you know, people can say whatever they want about Sheena, but she really has been very open with these issues and that her mind will kind of just think about the worst possible things that could possibly happen. You know, that this is very real to her. And that's why I always talk about like how our minds all work different is that sometimes I wish, like I used to pray to God that I wish my mind would just like leave me alone sometimes and just because you see somebody put on a smiling face or they're all happy and bubbly and like, get me on my good side, like take pictures, like it doesn't mean that they're not freaking out on the inside. And I can see sometimes why Sheena gets the rough time she does. And I think it does. It's hard because I do know Sheena a little bit now and I do know the some of the reality behind that. And she does go through these things and she does. I mean, like people fucking like. Like, stop singing. You suck. Like, that's got to be really tough to hear and read and see and all of that stuff. Um, but anyways, uh, I, I will say, like I've always said since the beginning of the show, good as gold is a bop. I love it. I mean, and that's kind of what you want is something that just like makes people happy and good as gold always makes me happy. I love it. But anyways, she was like, I couldn't even be alone with my daughter in the beginning. So outside of my immediate family, we haven't really let anyone watch summer on their own yet. So she says, I just think starting with someone like Tori, who I've known since she was 16, who I trust. He's like, I'll take anything, honey. I've been asking for this for a while. Come on now. This will help. I promise you. We get a nanny. It'll help your confidence. And I want that. And she was like, yeah, and she's smiling which is great. But I do have to say the person they're talking about, Tori, who Sheena's supposedly known since she was 16, Tori is the girl that allegedly that we see in the, the trailer that Katie Maloney and Tom Schwartz are both competing for their affections. Remember that storyline in the preview? That's Tori. So Sheena, this nanny that you're, you're hiring to watch Summer Moon, Katie Maloney and Tom Schwartz falls in love with your nanny? I mean, this can't help your OCD and your anxiety at all. Your and your nanny that watches Summer Moon is 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 tempting everybody on Vanderpump Rules, and she seems really young. I I don't even know how this like. And now I'm wondering, was this set up too? Like it's just, it's like how this is all tying together is just wild to me. So we're in a new scene where Schwartz is at uh, this bar called the Belmont, which is on La Cienega in WeHo. Um, that they always do scenes at and they always hang out at in real life. Uh, this is where also Schwartz had that uh, like Tinder or hinge date last season with that girl. Remember, he's like, I don't maybe Dayton's not going to be so bad after all. Who I'm getting the Schwartz. I'm getting the Schwartz back, you know? Anyways, I remember being at this bar. This is from September 30th, 2019, when I went with some of the Vanderpumpers to karaoke. And I don't know if you can hear this. I just found, I remembered this video and I found it. Uh, this is Tom Sandoval singing lover boy, the classic song 
by Billy Ocean. I don't know if you can hear this. Lover, lover boy, gonna be your lover. You can hear me in the background going, pretty good vocals. <laughs> so Sandoval walks up with the shoes, is going to give to Schwartz. He's like, what's up, dude? Hey, what's going on? I brought you a gift, dude. You did? I don't know if you're drinking. I got you a non-alcoholic beer. I'm not drinking, dude. Nope. Sober Tom scares me a little bit. Although I think it's great for your mental health and like physical health, obviously. Yeah, dude. One of the catalysts for getting sober was because Raquel was going away to a facility and I knew she couldn't drink. And so Tom opens the shoes. He's like, wow, my favorite running shoes. The last thing I was going to do was drinking and going out while she was out there. Like I figured we could do it together when she got out. So, you know, this is Tom being like good guy, Tom, like I'm, I'm in love with her. I was going to quit drinking for, I did quit drinking for, we could quit drinking buddies together. Anyway, Sandoval hugs Schwartz. Like I missed you, dude. Which the last time we saw them hug was when he was like, dude, I fucked up, dude. Ah! When he was over at Schwartz's place in the Scandoval episode, which was also the place he would go like whack off to Rachel on FaceTime. Remember he'd like, Oh uh, yeah. Sometimes you use my place to have FaceTime calls with Rachel. Oh my God. Anyways, I missed you, dude. And she was like, Oh, I miss you too, man. Uh, I feel like, um, I feel like you've become like, like a mythological creature, like, uh, like a cryptid. What? He's like, it's kind of good to see you. Good to see you too. How was your trip? Oh my God, dude. They ran us. Did you cry? Yeah. Fuck. Yeah, I did, dude. It sounds awful, but honestly, I would have preferred it to like just having to with deal with shit at the bar like I did. I know there was collateral damage. I'm really sorry, Schwartz. Uh, I really am, dude. Um, I can feel like you're angry at me, dude. But obviously, I fucking had a tour and stuff. Like my bank account was literally overdrawn. Dude, Ariana, like, hasn't paid any of the bills for, like, eight fucking months, man. I'm literally, like, moving $1,000 into this account. I'm moving 500 from this account to go cover the mortgage. And they're talking to Ed. She's like, I've been pretty much paying everything all out of my account. Gardener is cleaning, utility, pins and batteries. And it kind of, like, pulling teeth to get Ariana to pay me back, dude. It really hurt my feelings, Schwartz, that you would go on ball podcast. Jackson's fucking podcast and said, I'm like touring to live my rock star dreams and glory. I was upset. Cause like we're dealing with your shit back in the bar. Like I know we asked you to step away, but like I was in your situation and I realized the shit show I caused, I would have been reaching out dude. And like pitching ideas, pitching solutions. What do you want me to do, dude? I don't know. Like, Hey guys, can I hire a publicist to help out? I just want to let you know. I'm so fucking sorry. If you be resentful, then fucking be resentful and call me a fucking asshole to my faith, dude. Do it to my face. Don't do this backhanded shit. Tom, Tom, no, listen to me. And Schwartz is like, just take it. All you should be saying is you're sorry. I'm sorry your feelings hurt, but dude, I feel like I just, I, I put a half a million dollars. You put more in. I, I care, dude. I care about it. I do. Okay. Well, it didn't feel that way. It just didn't seem that way, dude. Just didn't seem like you gave a shit, to be honest. I understand what I did. I fucked up. It was fucking terrible. I know I did this. I'm sorry. I think it would actually help for me to go in there, dude. But see, look, I can't. I just want to fucking move on, dude. You're going to get there, dude. Short says your birthday is tomorrow. Yeah. What are you going to do? I wanted to have like a few people over at the house. I figured I already want to be out. She is going to emo night. She actually extended the olive branch, you know, are you going to stick with me to, or what, Schwartz? Uh, I feel like um, I'm going to do what's best for me. And I'm like, fuck yeah, Schwartz, finally, okay. But it turns out what's best for Schwartz is sticking right by Sandoval's side. So listen, we all have our own, we all, you know, whatever's best for everybody. But that was actually a very interesting scene. It kind of shows how their relationship works because you see Schwartz kind of stepping up to the precipice of standing up, not only for, his, for himself, but for his business, for the money. But you also see how Sandoval is like, not like he'll take it to a point, but he won't fully relent. He won't. Because Schwartz even says in that scene, take it, dude. Just take it. All you needed, all you should be doing is just saying you're fucking sorry. And Sandoval 
like you can beat him into doing that, but it takes a lot. And then he immediately goes back to try trying to defend indefensible behavior. Right. I thought that was a really, really interesting scene, which kind of shows really how their relationship works. And remember, the scene started off with Tom Sandoval giving Schwartz a gift. Here's these shoes I got for you. Right. I don't know. I thought that was really interesting. More of that, please. Now we go over to Sheena and Brox and Marina Del Rey. And they're getting ready to go out for emo night. Um, uh, you know, and we see Summer Moon, a fucking star who has been blocked by Tom Sandoval. And we see uh, Sheena's mom come down, who is one of Summer Moon's favorite people, I'm sure. Erica, Sheena's mom. So Tori's coming over. Sheena says she's known her since she was 16. And we see pictures. She's someone who spent time with Summer before. And she's someone I absolutely trust. And so she's hoping her OCD brain can like take a nap tonight while she's at oh, emo night. And so Tori, Sheena's friend, comes in, hugs Sheena's mom. Summer Moon's there. Summer Moon's like, I'm a star. This Summer Moon, cute as a button. And they're like, your auntie's here, Auntie Tori, that uh, Schwartz and Katie both are going to be in love with eventually this season. Uh, Brock's like, you're still nannying right now. What are you doing? And Tori says, I've taken a step back from acting. I'm focusing on music. What's going on with you? And Sheena's mom has a torn rotator cuff and she can't really pick up Summer Moon and lay her in her crib. So Sheena just needs her to help a night or two. And when she needs to be put in the crib, that's all she is looking for. I will say, though, the the, the fact that I know this little storyline potentially with Schwartz and Katie, this girl looks so young, like looks really, really young. But anyways, they just need like some basic things with Summer Moon and Tori seems completely up for it. So great. Right. But there is an interesting little moment in this scene where Brooke's like, eh, you know, it's a Sheena's little messed up brain, you know, what is it? Or OCD. And Sheena's like, shut up, shut up. What is it? Why did I just trigger you when I said that? Um, and I thought that was kind of an interesting little moment. And Sheena's like, no, it's she's my everything, Summer Moon. And I'm just not going to leave her with anyone. It's like, we're not leaving her with anyone. And she's like, this is a really big deal for me. And she starts crying to bring in somebody else to help. So I figure, like, start with Tori, baby steps. Why are you saying please to me? I've been asking for this for months. In a talking head, she says, I just miss my wife at the end of the day. Before we had summer, we were this juggernaut of getting things done. And now for Sheena, day-to-day -day simple tasks become monumental, overwhelming. It's a lot of thought process. What about this? What about this? And the problem is there's a lot of what ifs. We don't get anything done. And Eric is like, hey, sometimes you got to validate her feelings. And Brock's like, she's got two of you validating your feelings right now. And Erica's like, you're her husband. I'm trying to support. I'm trying to help with that. But you can say, mm hmm, but like you surround yourself with yes people. And she's like, no, I don't. And Erica's like, don't say that, Brock. And Erica's like, I raised two daughters who don't need anything from me. Yes, do you guys need my help and want my help with Summer? But that's not Sheena not being one of the most independent people I know. And the same with my daughter, Courtney. And she's like, I think I always have to ask for your opinion and your approval and your assurance. And Erica's like, you don't though. So Sheena and I talking, I says, I'm hoping I can get to a place where I'm not afraid to do things alone with my daughter, where I don't worry about something bad happening to her every day or to Brock or to my mom. I want to be able to enjoy living in the moment and not think that this could be the last moment. This seems like really real. So my heart does go out to her for this. And it is curious about Brock's reaction to this. And I wonder if this will be continuing to be a storyline this season. Cause that's that. So, uh, this scene, this scene is hard. It kind of is like, Anne, Tom's assistant, poor Tori is just like hearing this conversation, this intense conversation all of a sudden. But anyways, we get to a laughing place and Brock's like, Hey, Summer Moon, you want uh, Tori to stay with you a bit? And Summer Moon literally is picking for gold. She's got like a full phalange up her nose. And she looks at Tori and she's like, can you make Sandoval unblock me? No, she seems totally thrilled with Tori. So we're good to go. We're good as gold. So I'm wondering how this leads to Schwartz and Katie falling in love with Sheena's nanny. Oh, God, what a mess. Now we're at James and Allie's new house by the airport. 
And then this cat, their cat's like, Ellie's like, are you going to meet a new friend today? And Schwartz is like, oh, I saw you guys, but I, I still had to knock. He's like, welcome to Casa Kennedy, Schwartz. And Schwartz is like, this is an African milk tree plant. It's a succulent. He brought him another plant. He's like, please take your shoes off, Schwartz. Your filthy shoes. We've got a couch. We've got the dining area over here. And Schwartz is like, seeing the joy that this new home is bringing James and Allie, um, it's hard not to feel a little bit of a sting from losing my dream home. And we do a flashback to Katie and Schwartz's house. I knew this was going to go there. A little sting from Pride says, you used to be a homeowner, Tom. Maybe you'll never be one again. Uh, you loser. Uh, weirdo. Uh. And then Allie is doing Schwartz's chart. She's like, at the beginning of the year, I officially started my astrology business where I meet with clients and we look at their birth charts and DJ James is like, you gave all the injo info, Schwartz. Good job. She's like, I was really interested in doing Schwartz's birth chart because I just, I mean, to put it nicely, I feel like he could use a little bit of direction. That's kind, Allie, a little. He's like, I've never had a reading before. So what we'll do, this is your natal chart. Uh, this is what the planets are doing at the exact moment you're in place. It was the Big Bang Theory. It's very unique, very personal to you. He's like, wow, the most Libra on a chart that I've ever seen. Whoa, really? Oh my God. It's the most Schwartzy thing ever. Like you want everything to be, uh, get along, peacekeeper to a fault. Yeah. Somebody has to be a people pleaser. Uh, I don't like that term. You like people. You're like a genuine person. I'm slutty with people, but that what's helped with you. That's what helps with your business. The career you chose. There's more good and bad. Allie's like professor positive. DJ James Kennedy gets a ding. Oh no. Tom Sandoval texted me. Tom Sandoval. Oh my God. Are you fucking with him? No, I'm not. And Allie's like, I have chills. Hey, James, what a clusterfuck I've caused. But it's my B-Day and I'm having a little gathering at my house. If you and Ali want to come by, no pressure. I get it if you already have plans. Are you going, Schwartz? I'm going to go for a little. Dude, what the fuck? I can try and pop by for an hour, but I'm not sure. Ali's like, that's great. Our Libra moons love that, Ali says. On his birthday, I'm sure he's not going to come at me. He, you know, he better not. If he came at me at his house, bro, God, I'm going to egg the place. I'll aim for the windows only. This is a menace in me. That's what I would do. I would do that. This is so funny, though. TJ James Kennedy is just, he looks like he gets like a boner immediately. It's like, oh, God, Tom Sandoval texted me. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I got the golden ticket. I've got the golden ticket. Oh, my God. Do you think he's going to be nice to me? What should I wear? How should I do my hair? Guys, nice. It's so weird. Like, I didn't even realize they were in that place where you would even consider it, but they're filming. Also, I love, hey, dude, I really made a clusterfuck. <laughs> I like Sandoval's like, hey, dude, I really made a clusterfuck of things. Anyways, got a B-Day coming up. <laughs> Can I count on you for a, to be a bro tonight? So funny. We cut over to Tom and Ariana's dungeon, and he's like, and dude, you did a great job on the balloons, man. And he's like, oh, thank you. And we we see like a really sad, like like 10 balloons. He's like, it's giving me like baby shower vibes. Poor Anne. Just poor Anne. Um, so then we go upstairs. Ariana's getting ready for emo night. So she's doing her makeup. Maya's in there. I don't even know how Ariana finds the makeup palette and all of that shit. Um, so Katie's up there too doing emo makeup. We see everybody getting ready. Sheena and Lala. We hear some fun emo music. Come on this way for a good time. And DJ James Kennedy in the car is like, I'm really nervous about this. And Allie's like, this is a bad idea. Maybe we should turn around. It's not too late. I'm not trying to mend things with Tom, Allie. No, I know. No, I have yet to hear anything he has to say to me. What I need to hear from Sandoval is a very simple, I'm really sorry. This is absolutely awful. And what I did was just an absolute betrayal. And I'm not sure if I can ever come back to this, but if there's one thing that I'm going to do is work every day to try, you know, it just, I do feel like I do need an apology from just so we can at least be cordial. Do you know what I mean? He needs some meaning and he has to be like, show me that he is my friend. I haven't seen him without a mustache in years, Ali. We flash back to your one with a mustache. She laughs. That in itself is a sight to see. And Ali just laughs like it is so funny 
And you try to think psychologically about this is that you really do get the feeling that Tom Sandoval meant a great deal or he represented a great deal to DJ James Kennedy. And think about that. DJ James Kennedy really did think Tom loved him like a younger brother. Like he did help pay for Richella, his engagement to Rachel, Raquel, whatever we call her. And so there's this little boy in DJ James Kennedy that's like, I need, uh, he better, he better kiss me. He better, like it is so, it's like, it's weird how he talks about Tom and he's like giddy about it. He, you know what he better do? He better wrap me up in his big Tom arms and just give me a big old squeeze and say, I'm never giving up on you. I love you. You're my little brother. Please. I'm sorry for everything I did. The ultimate betrayal. Not Ariana to me. DJ James Kennedy guys night. It's wild how he thinks. Okay. So now we jet on over. Oh, we're back at Tom and Ariana's and Santa was like, oh, Jason, this is going to be my first birthday that I've never been drinking. And then Jason's like, whoa. And Santa was like, I've got mushroom chocolates, dude, which is kind of funny because so I'm like, oh, he's sober, but he's still doing hallucinogens, which potentially means he's doing other. He's just not drinking, which is like baby steps. Right. But maybe we shouldn't paint the picture of like, he went completely clean and sober. Cause I don't think I'm not, I haven't been to a mental health facility in a while, but I don't believe uh, you can do mushrooms there unless I'm, unless I just am not going to the right ones. But I don't think Rachel was like, um, uh, on the second month, we all um, did mushrooms and looked at the stars. Anyways, people start arriving to his party and it looks like a lot of his band members. You got Kyle Chan, you got Brett Kenyon, you got, you got a, a who's who. Um, <laughs> I think it was Bravo breaking news. The Instagram account. Uh, I was just checking it a second ago. They did the funniest meme. It said Tom Sandoval and the paid extras. <laughs> That was so, that was brutal. Oh my God. But it did seem like a lot of people that were potentially on Tom's payroll of some sort. She's like, welcome, dude. Um, you know, I've got the show to stream over here, you know, beer than the fridge, anything that you need, dude. So Tom's tech crew, his band walks in. Uh, Kyle brings a bottle of Don Julio, 1942. Not for Tom because he's not drinking. Uh, so listen, you know, you want him to have a good time. It's his birthday. I don't know. It's a whole weird vibe. Billy Lee shows up, you guys. Billy Lee is back. Yay. We'll see how that all plays out. So Kyle Chan's like, yeah, Tom hasn't been drinking for a couple months. They all cheers. Very fun. And then Tom goes, I still do have friends, dude. We cut over to emo nights. Yeah, 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 yeah. The crowd is packed. This thing always sells out. We see Ariana and Katie walking up to the venue. They go backstage. Uh, this has got to be pretty exciting to do. Sheena arrives. Lala arrives. And Lala's like, yo, is my bangs given emo? I think it's so funny that Lala went to an emo night because I just don't associate emo music with Lala at all. And I, Lala's even like, what the fuck am I at? Like, are you kidding me? And then we jet back on over to Tom's. His birthday cake is out and it says, happy birthday, Tom, instead of, you know, the, the cakes that he hates, where he's like, he's a worm with a mustache. Fuck, fuck Lady Jane cakes. Tom Schwartz comes in and Kyle Chan's like, you're not at emo night. And Schwartz is like, I'm emo inside, dude. I'm emo inside. Ah, uh, the cake does not say Sandoval's a liar. And uh, the cake actually says happy 40th again, because uh, Sandoval, this is his second year that he's turned 40. Uh, they found out. So anyways, DJ James Kennedy's like, I'm pulling up, I'm pulling up. And they actually show us pulling in, pulling up. He's like, cause they live right off the main drag. Ali goes, I don't have a close relationship with Sandoval. And really, I genuinely care about Ariana. So I just don't see a point in trying to force a relationship and she's like hurry back text me james so she stays in the car what she's awesome man i love that she has like some principles but dj james kennedy knocks on the door i'm so nervous i hope he apologized for the greatest betrayal ever please i just i love that ali's in the car it just cracks me up okay so 
He's just out there breathing. Uh oh. And Jason's like, hey, I think someone's here. Tom Sandoval goes and gets the uh the door. Maya's barking. He opens the door, very tense. What's up, dude? Hey, come on in. All right. All right. And DJ James Kennedy pets Maya. Hey, baby. Hello. What's up, man? Good to see you. Bring it in, dude. Bring it in. Hug. Do you want something to drink or something? He's like, I'll take a water. Tom Spotty's like a who's who. Huh. Like, who the fuck are you people? Tom used to be the coolest guy on the block. Now look. Oh, that's so brutal. <laughs> he gives him a diet squirt, Tom's favorite drink. He's like, I, I can't stay long. Let's have a little chat. And Tom's like, sure. I uh, just, I got to grab something. Just uh, have a little thick. And then Brett, who's been on the show before, Brett, the Tom Tom server, he's trying to make a conversation with DJ James Kennedy. He's not having it. He's like, like I was saying, who the fuck is this guy? I came to talk to Tom if he doesn't want to talk. And Brett's like, I'll, I'll go get him. I'll go get him. Tom's uh, showing off his bad knees to everybody. He's like, they're popping, dude. My knees are really bad. And DJ James Kennedy's like shaking his head. Brett gets Tom, pats him on the shoulder. He's like, no, okay, yeah. um, Yeah, I'll talk to you, dude. Okay, yeah. Oh, man, dude. Um, huh. How's the new house, dude? Amazing. Finally pulled the trigger. It's fucking crazy. Like one year later, so much has changed, you know? Yeah, like everything has, dude. I feel like a big brother, like to me, has like kind of gotten lost because I was kind of expecting a text, you know what I mean? Which never came. Um, I apologize for that. Um, I should have. I was very overwhelmed. Yeah, I know. But then I'm talking like months go by. Like there were so many opportunities. I've seen you as well on Instagram. Like you've been doing your own thing. Like you look fine. For what it's worth, man, I'm sorry that I didn't, you know, reach out to you. Are you sorry for like betraying me? And he goes, betraying you? Like, like the ultimate betrayal, dude. Like the ultimate betrayal. And then he goes, before I answer that question, it's a yes or no question. Sorry. <laughs> And he goes, but I'm betraying you. And then DJ James Kennedy goes, it's a yes or no question. And he's like, before I answer that question, um, I would just like to point out, like, you know, when you did that shit with Kristen, no, we're not going to talk about 10 years ago. I'm going to stop you right there. And we flash back to 2013. James referred to me as his best mate. Then he starts banging this guy on my bed with my condoms. DJ James Kennedy's like, you have so much growing up to do, Tom. Still, it's sad. You want me to take accountability, dude? It's embarrassing, Tom. I'm not going to even entertain what you just said. It's very narcissistic for you to say. <laughs> Thanks for stopping by, dude. And DJ James Kennedy leaves. Tom wants to bring up the past. You know, I'm looking for a, an a, apology. Nothing makes it okay to be lying to my face for six months. Makes me outcast for the entire for the entire group, call me crazy, all because he was just getting, wanting to get his dick wet. <laughs> and then he's back up to Ali. He's like, is it illegal to piss on J J it's Tom's bush? It's Ariana's bush too, as we see DJ James Kennedy pissing. If DJ James Kennedy was a real man, he'd shit on that bush. And then we have a to be continued and we do not have the trailer for next week. But I just want to say it's truly it's the blind leading the blind. Like it is like it's true mess. Like, listen, I know DJ James Kennedy's hurt. Like it's the 10 years ago. Yeah, it's 10 years ago. But it's just it's just wild. So I started off the show. Lala and Ariana, DJ James Kennedy, Tom, like DJ James Kennedy and Tom. You just just like. It is funny. Like you made Sandoval say that somebody else was narcissistic. Like that's that's pretty funny. DJ Dam's gonna be pisses on his bush. You pissed on my bush 10 years ago, dude. Come on. So we, they already released the first seven minutes of next week's episode, which picks up right where we left off here. And Sandoval has a funny conversation with Schwartz. But I don't know. What did you guys think of this episode? It was uh it was something I'm just truly my head is swimming because we see Tom here, and even that, like seems to be a recurring theme where Tom was not picking up the phone for anybody, not for Schwartz, not to apologize to DJ James Kennedy, not to apologize to anybody. So he was just out there on the road and you could say, okay, he was just out there surviving, but he wasn't truly trying to pick up the pieces. And I really highly doubt he was in any sort of therapy because I think a therapist would have tried to gently suggest 
trying to start making amends in certain ways and reaching out in certain ways. So who knows? I'm curious if information like that will ever come out, but we also know where he's at now in regards to, you know, Nick Vile's podcast is he seems like even angrier than he was then. So who knows? Now I was going to cover the after show, but my voice is a little thrashed right now. So I'm going to add that into the Beverly Hills recap on Friday. And we're just going to call it a day right here because I am exhausted. I might, I like literally, I, 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 I was thinking about Tom Sandoval, like, oh, I just party, like, oh, I just parties every night. Well, Ariana must have been disgusted. But all I do is I just podcast about these people every night. Oh, my God. Oh, but anyways, folks, I want you to have the best Thursday that you can possibly have. And I'll be back here bright and early for that Beverly Hills recap on Friday, where we'll talk more Vanderpump rules. We'll do some news, the Beverly Hills episode, and we will call it a week. And uh, yeah, thank you, guys. Thank you for being here. Guys, nights. Bye.